Hello, and welcome to the Sarcoma Foundation of America's panel discussion, Clinical Trials in Sarcoma. My name is Dean Fralick, and I'm the Director of Scientific Affairs at SFA. Thank you for taking the time to join us for what promises to be a very interesting session. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly go over the format and logistical details of this webinar. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's session. We have three panelists who will explain clinical trials, clinical trial phases, how endpoints and trial success are determined, and their role in advancing research. They will also discuss how patients can participate in tr clinical trials, trials that are open, eligibility requirements, and when patients should talk to their physicians. They will also discuss the challenges, challenges and benefits of clinical trial participation from a, per a patient's perspective. After their presentations, we will have a questions and answers session. I will ask the panelists questions submitted by webinar participants. At any time during today's session, you can submit your questions by entering them in the questions field. Our panelists will not be able to answer your questions related to your specific medical situation. So please make sure that your questions are related to the topics raised during the session. The information contained in this webinar is intended to be for educational information purposes only. It is not a substitute for medical advice from your physician about your specific situation. Today's session is being recorded and a link will be posted to SFA's website. Lastly, as a reminder, all participants are muted and any questions or comments can be submitted through the webinar's question portal. An important part of our mission at the Sarcoma Foundation of America is to provide educational opportunities to help empower the sarcoma, sarcoma community. Now I would like to introduce our panel members. Katie Wintergerst was diagnosed with synovial sarcoma in February, 2018. Katie has fought every day since to keep the sarcoma at bay, completing multiple rounds of chemotherapy, radiation therapy, resections to both lungs and immunotherapy clinical trials. Since her diagnosis, Ms. Wintergerst has been active with the SFA Race to Cure Sarcoma Louisville, serving as the event's co-chair. In addition, she has brought significant attention to sarcoma by participating in interviews with local media. Dr. Richard Gorlick is Division Head and Department Chair of Pediatrics, Department Chair at Interim of Sarcoma Medical Oncology in the Division of Cancer Medicine at MD Anderson Cancer Center and H. Grant Taylor, MD, W.W. Suto, MD, and Margaret P. Sullivan, MD, Distinguished Chair in Pediatrics. His laboratory is the founding bone tumor resource laboratory for the Children's Oncology Group. His molecular pharmacology laboratory is focused on osteosarcoma and is a member of the NCI-funded pediatric preclinical in vivo testing program and past member of the Pediatric Preclinical Testing Consortium. Dr. Gorlick is involved in clinical trials in part as past chair of the Bone Tumor Disease Committee for the Children's Oncology Group. He is currently the chair of the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas Advisory Committee on Childhood Cancers. Dr. Myrna Gounder is an internationally recognized medical oncologist and investigator who holds dual appointments in sarcoma and early drug development programs at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He specializes in personalized cancer genomic data to develop new drugs across solid tumors with a specific focus on sarcoma and rare cancers. He's the principal investigator of several global clinical trials. He's the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center Physician Ambassador to India and Asia. In this capacity, he is building cancer care networks in Asia to improve access to patient care, education, graduate medical training, and advancing cancer research and clinical trials. Again, thank you to the panelists for joining us today. I will now hand it off to Ms. Wintergerst who will provide the first presentation today. Thank you, Dean. Um, and thank you to all the panelists um, for joining me today and all the participants for being here. Um, so as Dean mentioned, my name is Katie Wintergerst and I was diagnosed with the novial sarcoma um, stage four high grade in February of 2018. Um, first, I'm going to run through a bit of a background just so you can see what treatments I've received and kind of what's gotten me to where I am today. 
and then I plan to discuss some um, challenges that I see in the clinical trial space from a patient perspective, and then also some resources that are available. So um, like mentioned, I was diagnosed in February 2018, and I completed I, what I understand to be the standard neoadjuvant treatment plan for synovial sarcoma. So I completed six rounds of the AIM treatment uh, chemotherapy, followed by 25 treatments of radiation to the primary tumor in my leg. And the, we ended 2018 with the primary tumor being resected successfully with clear margins um, in October 2018. So very exciting at that point. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't super long lived as the first spot then showed up on scans in my uh, really my first three month scan point in February of 2019. Um, I have since had um, tumor shown on the left lung, on the right lung, had wedge resections to either side. Um, I, I live in Louisville, Kentucky, and in Louisville, we do not have a sarcoma specialist or a sarcoma treatment center. So um, I, at this point, had done, um, I had local oncology team that had traveled to Vanderbilt, um, the Ingram Cancer Center there at Vanderbilt to seek counsel in my treatment course, um, and then decided, okay, it's, you know, the beginning or, or mid 2020, um, and we've got to kind of keep keep these spots at bay in my lungs. So I decided to go to MD Anderson, um, really to see what else was out there. And um, you know, it can be, and I'll talk about in a bit, but it can be a challenge um, seeking out for several reasons. That second or third opinion, but that was the first touch point where I'd gone elsewhere to see what else is out there. Um, what clinical trials could be available. Um, I was screened for a clinical trial um, testing my HLA type and was hopeful to get into a clinical trial um, at that point. And my HLA type did not come back as the type that was needed. So at this point, I still really had no clinical trial options. Um, came back home, completed some more rounds of bifosfamide, um, and then that, at which point a trial became available and is actually being offered at my local hospital. Um, it was a trial sponsored by BioAtla. So that was a rather easy decision to just give this tri trial a try. And I'll talk about it in comparison to my other decision point in a minute. So I completed a couple rounds of the BioAtla trial in 2022. Um, unfortunately, didn't see overwhelming success for myself. So came off of that, went on to, to decarbazine as another treatment form, um, in which case I did that for a handful of rounds before um, August, 2022 um, is when we host our race to cure sarcoma in Louisville. And I was presented with uh, Brandy Felser, uh, connected me to uh, Dr. Brian Van Tyne at Siteman Cancer Center in St. Louis, where I was offered a spot on the C4 uh, therapeutics trial. Um, unlike the BioAtla trial, it was a tough decision to go on the C4 trial. Um, it was an early trial with little to no data, really phase one, two. I think I was probably in the first 30 patients or so that were a part of the trial. Um, I had to make a decision quickly because obviously that spot was going to go to somebody else if I wasn't taking it. Um, I live in Louisville and this trial would require me to be in St. Louis quite often, especially at the beginning, which took me away from my family and my support system. And then, you know, what would that do to my job and, and how much would that cost, et cetera. So those were some of the challenges or the negative side effects that I saw of deciding to participate in the C4 trial. Um, some of the positives were it was obviously something new. Um, I am always ready for a break from chemo, so it was not chemotherapy. Um, the side effects that were being seen in others were minimal to none, which was exciting. And um, I had connected with Dr. Van Tyne in St. Louis, who is a specialist to sarcoma and a specialist to synovial sarcoma, and I was excited to be there. So ultimately, I decided to take part in the C4 therapeutics trial, 
I've now, I think I'm on my 14th cycle of this trial. Um, and in a, just over a year, I have seen um, positive results being no progression for myself and even some slight regression in disease. Um, so it's been uh, a good decision for me. Taking a step back, just thinking about challenges that myself or others would face um, when deciding to participate in clinical trials for sarcoma, um, the number one thing that comes to mind is expense. There, at the beginning of the trial, I had to travel to St. Louis every week. Um, thankfully, the trial protocol that I'm on allows for reimbursement for mileage, but you know I understand that's not necessarily always out there. So travel expenses, food expenses, time away from your job. Thankfully, my employer has been very flexible and I work in a remote situation anyway, so I'm able to kind of take my job with me where I go. Um, but the expense and the burden of that, I think, would be the number one item. Secondly, um, living in a city where there is no sarcoma uh, uh, treatment center, it pulls me away from my support system when I'm gone. And then I rely heavily on my support system to kind of keep everything going. I have two little kids while I'm gone. Um, another that comes to mind would be fear of the unknown. Um, any clinical trial is still that clinical trial. It's not FDA approved and you, you, you're getting potentially into something that you're just not for sure about, or it's not necessarily proven out for years and years. Um, a challenge for me is uh, trying to understand now at you know, 14, 15 months in um, why I can't do some of the stuff at home. I go to St. Louis once a month at this point, basically to get another 30 days of pills and have a couple tubes of blood drawn and it, it's um, logistically challenging and uh, you know at some point it, I'm like can't we just do find an alternate way to do this um, but I, I will still keep going because it's a treatment plan that's working for me um, and then just finally a challenge of not really a clear definition of success are you going to come out on when is the end point what is the end game? Is it stability? Is it shrinkage? Is it is it even going to do anything for me or is it this just going to help the next person? Which isn't bad, but it's kind of un, just not a lot of clarity around what's our ultimate goal here. Um, so um, obviously with all those challenges, it's really important to have resources available to reach out to. So the number one thing that comes to mind is Sarcoma Foundation of America. I would not have been connected with Dr. Van Tyne or been offered this spot on C4 without Brandy Felser and, and the whole Sarcoma Foundation of America team. Um, and they also have opportunities like Jordan's Dream Fund to help with that number one challenge for clinical trial participation in my uh, viewpoint of the expense. So um, SFA is a critical resource and anytime I meet any newly diagnosed um, friends or colleagues, uh, they I always say reach out to SFA, find out where the research is happening and see if they can get you connected for your specific subtype. Uh, uh, your care team can absolutely be your resource. So whether it's your medical professionals, your nurse, um, a social worker, they can all be people that you could talk to and, and bounce ideas off of. Um, and then also, like I mentioned before, not being afraid to feel like you might be rustling some feathers when you want to go seek a second or third opinion or find out another option out there, because it is your life at the end of the day but knowing that those people do make up a critical resource for you. Um, and then I hate to say social media, but I have found value in small social media circles where other patients are on the same treatment more than hearing it through the medical team or reading on a paper. You can actually see what types of side effects people are, are, are feeling or are experiencing from clinical trials.
and then we have a Gilded's Club in Louisville. They offer a great um, sarcoma resource group as well. We're, we're connected and able to share information amongst people in, in my area that do have a sarcoma diagnosis. Um, so in all, I would say um, I am blessed to be still here, to have five years of fighting this disease and to have found this C4 trial that seems to be working for me. Um, it, but it's really required a shift in mind whereby the beginning treatment was the standard of care, the neoadjuvant, AIM, radiation, surgery, and then it kind of became, okay, what do we do now? And shifting that mindset to think, a clinical trial is not the last option. A clinical trial is where things are at today. And research is there, and that's where you need to be to receive the best treatment options that are available today. Because in sarcoma, there have not been a lot of, or really many at all, FDA approved treatment options in a lot of years. And so being in the research segment and in the clinical trials is the place you wanna be. So um, that's all that I had prepared. Um, and so I'm happy to turn it over to uh, Dr. Gorlick. Are you next? Thank you, Katie. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously an honor to be here and sort of to speak to the group. And uh, Katie, uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey and uh, so much wonderful advice. I always think it's so challenging to go after a, a patient who describes their experience because I think your advice is always going to be so practical and so relevant. That said, I, I, you know, sometimes uh, folks finish their talks and I'm like, oh my God, I'm way off. I, I actually have to remember to highlight, you know, many of the things you said as I go through. Uh, but I think we're sort of saying the exact same thing. You know, and I, I have to be honest, I missed a lot of the inconvenience to the patient. But again, you know, um, I, I think that's why the patient perspective is so important. So my charge is to talk a little bit about what are clinical trials. And clinical trials are really ways we ask questions. You know, people confuse those with treatments that we define as standard of care. Meaning if we know how to treat something, that should be the treatment the patient gets. But in a lot of times we don't know what that treatment is, you know, optimally. And that's where clinical trials are designed to answer questions. I think the confusion comes about because clinical trials over time are what defines the standard of care. So the thing that was the best in the last experiment really becomes what we recommend as standard of care until something else in the clinical trial proves something's better and then it replaces it as uh, the next thing. Because clinical trials ask a question, one of the clinical, uh, critical components of clinical trials is it's your option as a patient to decide whether or not to participate, meaning nobody can force somebody to sort of be part of an experiment they don't want to be part of. And so we need to explain to you exactly what we're testing, what is standard of care, to allow you to define whether or not you want to participate. You know, uh, although I'm the interim chair of sarcoma medical oncology, I am a pediatric oncologist by training. So when we deal with kids, uh, we have an additional concept of, you know, the parent is the person who actually gives the consent, but the uh, patient themselves then have to agree to it. So they get sent, they don't consent, with consent being more of a legal term and a send just being, meaning they go along with it. Next slide. So I, I have to start always when we talk about sarcomas, uh, talking about the challenges, particular to sarcomas, because there's a lot of uh, adult cancers that are much more common where clinical trials are easier. You know, for trials to be successful, you kind of need a lot of patients to sort of answer the question, and we're gonna come back to that, but. You know, in sarcomas, there's a lot of different kinds of sarcoma, um, and even in aggregate, sarcomas are rare. So it's very hard to sort of, you know, get big patient populations 
in order to be able to answer questions. Well, each of the sarcomas is different and they have different targets. So what may be an interesting therapy for one type uh, may not work at all uh, in others. And, uh, you know, it, it makes it a bit challenging. That said, um, there are clinical trials um, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. So next slide. So clinical trials, uh, exactly as you alluded to, come in different phases. And basically the numbering follows the stages of a drug development, but are not in any way the way a patient would approach clinical trials. So the way a clinical trial starts, you know, for a drug is first, you have to prove the drug safe. Second, you have to prove it works. Third, you have to prove it's better than standard of care. And then fourth, you have to prove that in the real world, it works the way you're expected to, it combines with other things, um, it doesn't cause other challenges on quality of life. And the one, two, three, and four I've labeled are sort of the labels for those stages of the clinical trial, meaning phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. But if I was a patient, I want the drug that's most proven. And so when you go to select a clinical trial, the best trial is gonna be if there's a phase four available, a four, then a three, then a two, and then a one. Largely going the opposite way the drug develops to get something that's more and more proven uh, to treat what you're tr uh, being uh, treated for. Next slide. If we start grouping clinical trials, the way I also think about it is phase three and phase four trials tend to be trials where you're comparing what the standard of care is to something that you think may even be better. Most of these trials are randomized trials where it's effectively a coin toss that decides which arm you're going to be on. And what allows it to be ethical is doctors and researchers believe the newer treatment is better, but they don't know for sure. And they're comparing it to what uh, standard of care would be. Um, and the major question to uh, patients is like, do you want your treatment decided that way? Uh, I listened carefully uh, to Katie's story and at the beginning, uh, she was given standard of care treatment. My guess is at that time, there wouldn't have been a phase three or phase four trial that was available for our histology. And it's very true that for sarcomas, sometimes one exists for what you have, and sometimes it doesn't. Again, because there's so many types of cancer, there may be a, a randomized trial for synovial sarcoma, but there may not be at a particular time, and they kind of come and go. Um, Next slide, phase one and phase two are really earlier stages in drug development. These are times where you're not sure the drug's gonna work. And in the case of phase one trials, you're not even 100% sure it's safe. The reason these become sort of ethically okay is um, you know, for new agents, many times the only way to get them is through, the, uh, through clinical trials. If the drug doesn't happen to be approved for a number indication, and it's something that drug company has just developed, the only way to get access to those drugs uh, is through participation in the clinical trial. And really, I agree with the statement, these are not last resorts. The question is whether you want to go through the inconvenience uh, of finding one to have this as a treatment option. A lot of times in these particular cases, the standard of care isn't a very good choice. Um, so this can be your best option. Next slide. You know, uh, phase one and phase two trials are usually single arm trials because, you know, there isn't another treatment. There's nothing to compare it to. And what folks do is they compare it to real world data. They compare it to how patients have done in the past. And what this requires is the trial to be specific to what it's targeting. It may apply to some sarcomas and not others. It may be a homogeneous population. 
And again, often there's correlative studies that blood tests you're referring to could be for safety, but could be for correlation to try to figure out whether it works or not, to try to know whether this is working. Next slide. There are other types of clinical trials, and I, I just wanted to be complete here. Not every clinical trial is therapeutic. There's some where they just collect your tumor, they just collect your name to try to understand how the population does. Some of them are for symptom management. Again, these studies tend to be not, uh, not as producing as much benefit, uh, but tend to have less risk than the therapeutic trials. And again, they're ethical because of that limited risk. And most of this doesn't provide direct benefit for the patient. And it's whether you want to contribute in this manner or not as the primary question. Next slide. Clinical trial endpoints, you know, for therapeutic trials, most of the time we use survival or the cancer coming back or the cancer becoming bigger as sort of the primary endpoints that we look at. Um, there's a lot of different ways to sort of condense this, like, you know, to sort of aggregate different outcomes. But really, it's the, uh, what happens to your cancer, what happens to you, those tend to be the endpoints that we use. Next slide. And then I, I just have to briefly talk about the concept of power. So power means statistical power. It's at the end of doing this clinical trial, do we know the result is meaningful or not? And what we're really getting at is if we take any given patient, they can do better or worse uh, even without treatment. And we need a way of starting to understand whether our treatment modified what would have been their natural history. And so what we use is this concept that we need sort of this to be a difference that we wouldn't see randomly meaning 80% of the time we'll see the same result if we did it again. And part of the reason we do it this way is we want to make sure we advance knowledge so that the next patient, this can ultimately become the standard of care for so that they don't have to participate in the clinical trial to get the benefit if it exists. Next slide. And then uh, Katie is absolutely right. There are not a lot of FDA-approved drugs. There haven't been a lot of success stories. But uh, to be honest, the sarcoma community is doing a little bit better than it did historically, meaning there have been a lot of gains long ago. But recently, a couple of drugs have been approved for some subtypes of sarcomas. And again, you know, what's kind of a challenge is, you know, one of them works in epithelioid. One of them works in alveolar soft part sarcoma. You know, and it may not be the particular sarcoma that you have that's benefited from this advance, but, you know, someday we hope everybody is going to see some uh, benefit from a uh, clinical trial. But, and again, I, I just gave a list of, you know, resources, but that was really, I think, intended as a segue uh, to uh, my uh, friend and colleague at Memorial Sloan Kettering and I think I turn it over to you next. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And, uh, you know, you've laid the uh, foundation, uh, Katie. Um, thank you for sharing your really brave story. And I think the, the trials and tribulations, no pun intended, are really extraordinary. I'm so happy to hear that you are doing well. And, uh, you know, 14 cycles uh, is pretty impressive. And I hope you keep going. And you know, one day you 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 beat this uh, sarcoma. So that's my hope and prayer for you. Um, and to all the audience, um, you know, I have some slides. It's uh, I've I've never met Katie before, and I had no idea which trial she was on. But of of the hundreds of trials, I happened to pick uh, the C4 therapeutics trial as an example uh, to talk about. So this is really uh, you know a great coincidence. Um, okay. So I have a couple of poll questions uh, for 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 the audience, um, and the main and the key learning objectives that I'm going to focus on is when should I talk to my doctor about clinical trials? Question number two is what clinical trials are open? How do I find out what trials I'm eligible for? 
And last question is, are all clinical trials a last resort? So uh, next slide. Um, um, Christy, can you run the, run the poll? So the question is, when should I talk to my doctor about clinical trials? Choice one, as a last resort. Choice two, at time of initial diagnosis. Choice three is when surgery is not possible. And choice D is at every visit. We're going to see if the uh, if the poll works. It's running currently. It is okay. We have results. We do. Okay. So 3% say as a last resort, 22% say at the time of initial diagnosis, 31% say when surgery is not possible, and 44% say at every visit. Okay, great. So we'll let's look at um let's look at the next slide and okay, good. Okay, nice. Nice distribution. We'll go into the, the details next. Next next slide. Okay. So my opinion, and you know, my colleagues may have different thoughts process, but my opinion is talk to your doctor about clinical trials periodically. And I'll explain to you why you should talk about it. Maybe every visit is a little too much, but periodically, you know, every so often, it's very important to talk about it. And I'm going to tell you why uh, this is this is important. First thing is, you know, Dr. Gorlick spoke about um, uh, clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. These trials are typically what's known as therapeutic trials, where there is surgery, radiation, immunotherapy, or a brand new drug that is going through the phases. But remember that clinical trials are not just therapeutic, but they're also non-therapeutic trials. So it's important to ask your doctors and your nurse practitioner and your nurses about whether the institution where you're getting treated also has non-therapeutic trials. Non-therapeutic trials uh, can be, say, for example, testing your tumor or your blood for some genetic uh, findings. It could be looking for some very unique proteins. It may be looking, doing some new type of a scan, a brand new scan that is relevant for your cancer is being developed, and that may also be a non-therapeutic or certain types of questionnaires looking at your quality of life. So these are very different than the therapeutic ones. And this is in many ways sort of contributing towards the, towards the field, towards helping develop the sarcoma uh, field itself into better things. So always think about therapeutic versus non-therapeutic trials. The therapeutic trials are what are known as interventional trials. So this is, it could be a new way of doing surgery, a new type of radiation, uh, maybe giving radiation in, in three days instead of 30 days, uh, uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or, or, or a brand new drug that has not, not been FDA approved at all, okay? So these are all therapeutic versus non-therapeutic. The most important thing to remember is that clinical trials are dynamic. Sometimes a pay, I will tell my staff, yes, there is a spot available for a clinical trial in the morning. By the afternoon, it, it's gone, okay? And we'll tell you a little bit more about why that happens. First and foremost, mo all clinical trials have limited number of spots. Phase one study may have smaller number of spots. A phase three may have hundreds of spots. And these trials are very dynamic. They close, they hold, they get held for accrual. And all of this happens because maybe there's a, a new side effect that was seen that was unanticipated. So the drug company and all the researchers get together and say, you know what, let's put a hold on this study till we understand this a little better. Maybe we'll change this back and forth. So even though we have a protocol, there is some flexibility within this, ultimately making sure that patient safety is, is upheld and paramount, okay? 
and new trials are opening all the time. And I will show you some examples of, of the trials that are currently going on in sarcomas. So you may come on one visit and say, hey, do you have any trials for me? And the answer may be no. Uh, two months later, there may be a brand new trial. And, and if you don't ask, sometimes doctors are busy and they may not even have the, you know, may just forget saying that, yes, you're right, there, a, a new trial has opened up. So make sure you ask periodically about, has, is, is anything new coming up? Okay. And if at the hospital where you are being treated is not available, you know, explore what Katie did. You know, she went to MD Anderson. She tried something there. She went to St. Louis. She tried something there. So it's, I'm not saying that it's feasible for everyone. I think she's outlined very clearly about how taxing that could be financially and on your support system and so many other things. But if it's feasible and if your insurance system covers it and, and your family and finances permit, do explore nearby hospitals, which is practical. I personally tell all my patients, I say, look, I don't know everything. I'd like you to go to MD Anderson, you know, get your foot into the door. I'd like you to go to Johns Hopkins. I'd like you to go to Dana-Farber, whatever it is good. Why? Because these are places where there are a lot of sarcoma experts. But more importantly, there's a lot of clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three. And sometimes you have to really move fast and hustle in order to get into a spot quickly. And when you really need a clinical trial, that may not be the best time to be a new patient in a new hospital, trying to get your pathology, your medical records, all of that reviewed. So right in the beginning, you know, go, you know, go to different hospitals where there's clinical trials and there are experts and get a medical record number there. Of course, you know, if your insurance and other things permit. Next slide. So that's uh, first question. When should I talk to my doctor about clinical trials? Second question is what clinical trials are open? How do I find out about trials that I'm eligible for? So this is a little bit more complicated, but I'm going to help you sort of a little bit give you a guidelines on how to do this. Next, next uh, slide. Okay, so here's another audience poll questions. What clinical trials are open? How do I find out what I'm eligible for? Choice one, you Google, you look on Facebook, or you search in social media. Question, uh, choice two, is you ask friends and family members. Choice three, you ask patient advocacy group. And choice D is ask your doctor and team. Okay, very good. Okay, so the 89% said ask doctor and care team, 40% ask patient advocacy groups, ask you know friends and family, and then some 20% Google, Facebook, media. Okay, you know, there, there's no one right answer. Next slide, okay. So in my opinion, I think for a disease like sarcoma, where things are so nuanced, and the word sarcoma itself, remember, is a hundred different types of cancers, and they are so nuanced. And at the genetic level, at the protein level, each of these cancers are completely different one from another. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a pretty unique disease. So having understanding of that is very important. So, patient advocacy groups, doctors and nurses, are your team, and they can give you really good information, high quality information, and what may be relevant for you. So if you are a sarcoma patient and say you have angiosarcoma, right? So there's an angiosarcoma patient advocacy group. If you have certain types of, and, 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 the, and the Sarcoma Foundation America sort of really has expertise on so many different types of sarcomas. So they know all the important clinical trials that's ongoing at any given time. So they are a really good source of high quality data. Um, another example is Desmoid Tumor Research Foundation. Here's another group 
that just focuses on desmoid tumor. So if you have a desmoid tumor, very well, there's a high likelihood that they will be on top of all the trials that that for that specific disease is going on, right? So both your doctors, your nurse practitioners, your nurses, as well as your patient advocacy groups are really, you should think of them as, as part of your team to get high quality data. Sometimes friends and family members, as well as Google and other things, while well-meaning may put you, you know, sort of send you down the wrong pathway. So you just have to be a little bit careful about where, what that source of information you're getting from. The second thing is you also have to know your unique precise diagnosis. So these days we are increasingly moving away from just this generic term sarcoma. You know, each disease, like Katie said, she had synovial sarcoma. So there are many, many studies just focused on synovial sarcoma. So you have to know the precise sarcoma diagnosis that you have. Most of the time we can get to it. Sometimes even with the best of efforts, we're not able to pinpoint and say, this is the exact type of sarcoma. And that's okay. In addition to that, there are also genetic testing known as next generation sequencing or targeted testing or single gene testing or certain types of protein testings. All of them can give a little bit more information about your precise diagnosis. Again, this is where you need to ask your doctor if there is a value in doing such studies. And sometimes there's even value in repeating it because why? Because technology evolves. You know, a gene testing done three years ago may be very different today. And, and the information is constantly evolving. And lastly, I would say be your own advocate. And when I say be your own advocate, what I mean is in addition to getting information from physicians as well as from patient advocacy group and other sources, you can go to this website called clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials.gov is a central repository where every clinical trial, therapeutic or non-therapeutic, has to be inputted there in order for it to be uh, conducted uh, um, uh, prospect uh, in order to be conducted, right? So this is a good place for you to go. But this can also be a little bit of a confusing place. So I'm going to show you how to navigate this clinicaltrials.gov and how you can get the most out of it. Right. So on the left-hand side, so the first thing I want you to know is this, this clinicaltrials.gov is updated, but it's not always updated. Like I said, sometimes like I will tell a patient, you know, there's a spot for you in the morning and by afternoon, the spot's gone, right? This website is under no circumstances will be able to update that kind of information. Only the doctors who are conducting these studies will have a really nuanced understanding of what's happening in the study. So let's look at the left-hand side. You open this website and it gives a couple of different search terms. The first one, it says a condition or disease. I put in sarcoma. Then it says other terms. You can add other terms, intervention or treatment. If you know a particular uh, treatment already, you can go ahead and input there. Then by location, I just put New York, New York. I put all studies and I hit the search button. And this is the results I've got. It shows me 466 studies are available. Okay, 466 studies. That's a lot of studies just in New York area. But as I said, the devil's in the detail. So as you scroll down on the left-hand side, you will see that the vast majority, right, almost 300 of those studies are no longer looking for participants. These studies are completed, right, or no longer looking for patients or they are terminated. So in essence, all you're left with are this 94 out of 466 studies that may be possibilities. Okay, so that's a good way to narrow down and use this filter. Second slide. So then when you do that and you narrow it down on the left-hand side, you see many different studies that have shown up. The first one says novel biochemical and molecular determinants for soft tissue sarcoma. So this is a study which I would call as a non-interventional study. All this study is doing is saying, look, participate in our study, give us your sarcoma tumor tissue. We will do research on it. We will do sequencing on it and we'll give share these results with you. Um, so that's one. The second one is looking at dose reduction of post-operative radiation for soft tissue sarcoma of the arms and legs. This is asking a question about radiation, right? And the last one down there is saying surveillance after extremity tumor surgery. So somebody had surgery of an extremity tumor, 
and then there's surveillance. So all of these are being studied in a rigorous manner to ans answer a very specific question. And then here's another study. This is what this is a study that Katie participated in. I, like I said, I had no idea this was a study she was going to go on. And it says, a study to assess the safety and tolerability of CFT8634 and locally advanced or metastatic smart b one perturbed cancers, including synovial sarcoma and smart b one null tumors. I mean, this is a mouthful. And to be honest with you, this is a confusing, like it's really hard to make sense of what this study is about, even if you are a medical oncologist, okay? This makes sense to sarcoma doctors, but I can promise you that most medical oncologists looking at this will say, I really don't have an idea what's going on. Most people will say, I have no clue what is smart b one perturbed cancers, okay? So this is, this is hard. Um, and and that's the that's the point is that this clinicaltrials.gov while it could be a resource, you know it's a good place to start looking around, digging around, but also you have to be careful because a lot of this information is not you know easy to interpret. Next slide, okay. So we're going to get a little bit more into this tumor. So the first thing is it gives you sort of a study overview. Okay, it tells you briefly what this is about, and right here on the intervention treatment all the way down. This will tell you it's a drug. The name of the drug is called CFT8634. But it doesn't tell you, is this IV? Is it you swallow by pill? Is it what is it? It doesn't really get into too much details. But it gives you a couple of other information. Right here, up here, it says it's a first in human phase one, two study. So this is what Dr. Gorlick was mentioning. A phase one study is really early on. We are not even sure what is the safety. We certainly do not know how efficacious these drugs are. This is very, very early on. Sometimes it's super promising, but also there's a lot of unknowns in these, in these kind of studies. Then it tells you that this is for synovial sarcoma and smart b one null tumors, okay? So smart b one I will tell you, is that this is, a, this is a very specific gene, okay? And there are some types of tumors that have loss of this, of this gene. If you didn't do genetic studies on your own tumor, it's very hard to notice. Or if there was not a very specific protein testing that was done to look for SMARC-B1, you wouldn't know whether you're eligible or not, or, or in, ineligible for this study. What I can tell you is that the vast majority of sarcomas do not, you know, their, their SMARC-B1 is intact, okay? So I think you know, I, I don't want to give the impression that everybody on this seminar should run and tell the doctors, did you check for smart b one I can tell you that smart b one loss is a really rare event in sarcomas, but something that you'd only know if you had some kind of a genetic testing done. And on the right-hand side, this goes into how many patients enrollment estimated. It's 110 patients. There is opening. When it opened, when do they think it's going to close? Okay. So this is how you interpret this a little bit more. Next slide, okay. Then it also tells you all the sites in the US where it's open and sometimes even outside of the US where this is. It tells you what's the name of the center that it's recruiting, the principal investigator or the doctor who's recruiting there, and also some sort of a contact information. And right up here, it says the chief medical officer, this is a phone number, it's a Boston-based company, so you see a 617 phone number for C4 Therapeutics, you can call them and get this information. If you scroll further down under this study, it'll tell you about eligibility criteria. And the first thing you'll see is something called inclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria is to make sure the right patients go on the right drug or the right intervention, okay? So if this drug, CFT uh, something something, happens to work only in synovial sarcoma or um, smart b one deleted tumors, you don't want somebody with, say, a liposarcoma or leiomyosarcoma or something else joining this program. The drug is not going to work because all the data has shown that the best place for these two things to come together. And that's why all studies will have an eligibility criteria. The right patients, right age, right disease type have to come to meet together. And that's why these studies are meaningful. But I have to tell you that this there's a lot of like medical jargon here. If you just went through this, it's pretty hard to sort of decipher and say, hey, am I eligible for this study or not? For example, look at number five. It says subject must have measurable disease as defined by resist version 1.1. So unless someone knows what is resist version 1.1, 1 
it's really hard to make sense of like, do I qualify or don't qualify? So, and this is just a small inclusion criteria. This list is like a 30, you know, it's a two, three page list, okay? Similarly, there's also, next slide, a exclusion criteria. This is if you if your kidneys don't work well, if your heart doesn't work well, if you have like certain tumors in your brain, or if you just recently had a stroke, there's or if you previously had a treatment similar to this drug called a BRD9 degrader, you do not qualify for these studies. The short answer is, you know, these eligibility criteria are really hard for someone who's not specifically trained in that study to kind of decipher and make sense, okay? And could be a very frustrating process. I think even for nurses and our clinical trial nurses who do this day and night, even for them, this is a challenging process to figure out is somebody eligible for a study or not eligible for a study. So my, my sort of advice is you can look at it, but don't spend too much time sort of getting into the, getting into the details. Next slide. <clears throat> So my last slide is, uh, when should I talk to my doctor about clinical trials? Um, I think it's the same question as the first one. Um, and, and this is sort of like, you know, just basically finishing it up so we can finish this and, and we're all happy to take your questions. Do we have an answer for the last one? Oops. That was the same. It was the same one as yep. the initial. Okay. So let's see. Just one second. Launch that poll again. In the meantime, I want to thank all of our speakers again uh, for, for uh, help. Uh, you know their their expertise in in the clinical trials. You can see at every visit was almost sixty percent at the time of initial diagnosis, thirty percent. So very good. Uh, we do have time for a couple of questions here. Um, first of all, um, we had a couple or one before uh, the the session began. It said. Um, can you speak about proton therapy and immunotherapy and their success uh, with soft tissue sarcomas? So maybe uh, Drs. Gorlick and Calendar can speak to that. Rich, you want to start? And then I can go after you. Yeah, so I'll start with the proton therapy side of it. So proton radiation is kind of complicated in how it rolls out relative to clinical trials. And I, I think the biggest difference between proton therapy and standard radiation therapy is how much radiation hits um, where you don't want it. Um, so what proton therapy is all about is a very large particle size so that it goes in and doesn't come back out, um, unlike traditional radiation. Um, so really, if I had a choice of having more exposure of normal tissues to something else versus less, I think I would almost always sort of say, well, I, I want less radiation where it doesn't belong. And that kind of guides how radiation oncology moves. So they're not very, you know, in some ways, they don't do randomized clinical trials because they don't think it's ethical to sort of, if it's appropriate, not give it. Um, so it's kind of a complicated question. Um, and then I think as a counterpoint to that, some folks would say, why don't you give a proton therapy to everybody? You know, depending on the sort of physical nature of the tumor, it may be that it's no better just because of its location. There's no benefit to not going in or out. Uh, so it tends to be a standard of care recommendation. Um, that's where I would start this and turn it over to you. <laughs> so what was the question? Can you repeat? It was the benefits of proton and then immunotherapy. What is it? 
What was yes. the... your thoughts on that? Can you repeat? Just tell me. Yeah. The... yeah. Can you speak about proton therapy and immunotherapy in their success in soft tissue sarcomas? Yeah, I mean, I I think the, I like Dr. Gorlick said, it's not that proton therapy, you know, is better than the traditional uh, photon therapy. It may be better, maybe question mark, in certain locations, and it may be better by, by basically causing less bystander damage because the the proton is thousand times bigger than than the electron that is normally used. Um, but it, you know, it has not been formally studied. So I think I would say the jury's out there for protons in sarcomas. In terms of immunotherapy, I mean, we've been, the word immunotherapy is pretty broad. And I would say, you, you know, these days we cannot just use the word immunotherapy. We have to say checkpoint blockade. This is something like Keytruda, uh, or, you know, nivolumab. Uh, those are known as checkpoint blockades or also new emerging um, uh, immunotherapy, uh, such as I think the one that Katie was looking into, this HLA-based T-cell engineer therapy. This is where your body's own T-cells or immune cells are taken out. They are re-engineered in the lab, and then they inject it back in. So immunotherapy is, is, a, is a hot field. If I were to just say checkpoint blockade, there's, we've been studying this for a long time. It turns out that it works really well in some types of sarcomas, but it's not a it's not an answer for the vast majority of sarcomas. I wish it was. But newer modalities of immunotherapy are being developed. So beyond checkpoint blockade, other things such as the synovial sarcoma T-cell engineered therapy uh, looks very interesting and, and new things are coming on the horizon. I just want to uh, say too that uh, we had a previous webinar on immunotherapies and sarcoma. So go to our website and check out that webinar as well. Uh, one other question um, that I thought was pretty interesting is, should you consider what lines of therapy to choose so you don't exclude yourself from future possible trials? Would your doctor know how to, uh, to look at that? Yeah, well, I, I can mean, start I off. Oh, yeah. go ahead. I mean, it's, uh, look, it's... Uh, I mean, my, I'll tell you my approach. There are a handful of sarcomas where chemotherapy is a requirement. And one of them, you know, the world's expert is Dr. Gorlick in osteosarcoma. You know, you must give chemotherapy, right? And so there's a couple of cancers where I say, if it's, you know, if the tumor is metastatic, if the sarcoma is metastatic, you know, I will say, you know, maybe we should think about clinical trials sooner when, when you're still healthy when you're still, you know, your heart, your organ, everything else is still, you know, really fit. So sometimes it's really about strategy and saying, you know, what we can always, we could do this first. We could do like, you know, uh, doxorubicin-based chemotherapy later on, because if you did this first, you may be ineligible for something else. Um, even in diseases like osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, there are now clinical trials that say, well, you know, we've made so much advance, but can we do even better? So even in situations like that, there are there are clinical trials in Ewing sarcoma and other things where we're still trying to push the boundary further and further. So I would say with the exception of a handful of sarcomas where chemotherapy saves lives, um, many other sarcomas, I think it's reasonable to think about a clinical trial, but it has to be thoughtful, you know? I don't want to give the impression that, all clinical trials make sense or good. I mean, I think somebody in the pan in asked the question, like we really need to have doctors explain a little bit better on why this clinical trial with the new drug makes sense for your sarcoma. I think that's something we don't probably spend enough time doing. And I think that's imperative to do. And again, I don't want to give the impression that all clinical trials and sarcomas and stuff people must enroll in, but I think you must ask the question. And as long as it makes like a strong rationale, it's okay to consider uh, these studies. Do you have anything to add, Dr. Gorlick? You know, what I was going to say is, you know, some folks do encounter at times that, you know, eligibility or exclusion of particular trials um, sort of restrict temporally um, how many prior treatments you could have had. 
And I, I think that may have been what they were asking about. I still think, you know, patients have to decide what they believe to be most promising for themselves. And I, I think just jumping at a treatment because it's more restrictive doesn't necessarily mean that's their best option. Um, and what you have to realize is, you know, side effects are cumulative, you know, just because, you know, this can be given early, it may be because it has more side effects rather than because it has a higher chance of being efficacious. Um, I do think a challenge for patients who have multiple options is deciding between the different choices that they may have. Um, you know, and again, I, I think some of that becomes based on potential side effects. Some of that becomes based on inconvenience. Um, you know, it's, you know, Katie, you talked about how much travel, like, you know, would you go far away as opposed to something local because it's first line? I don't know that that would be the best decision. So I think you always have to choose what's the best choice for you at any given moment among the options that may be available, not considering how they sequence. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, with that, I think we'll have to wrap up our session. Uh, thank you again, uh, Katie and Drs. Gounder and Gorlick for taking the time to be with us today and sharing your expertise. We appreciate all you do for the sarcoma community. And thank you to everyone who logged in today to be a part of the discussion. Uh, we would also like to thank our sponsors, um, as a reminder, today's session was recorded and a link will be posted to SFA's website within the next few days. Uh, you can find SFA online at www.curesarcoma.org. Uh, we also have posted information for future education sessions on our website. Uh, this now concludes the discussion. Thank you very much.